John McNellis, co-founder, McNellis Partners, a uh, development company based in Palo Alto, uh, heart of vaunted Silicon Valley. Uh, thanks for joining me today for ULI Next Global's uh, Visionary Leader Series. Um, we're here to discuss the, the personal and professional path you took to get to where you are, starting and managing a real estate development firm, key decisions you made along the way, lessons learned, and of course, outlook for the future. You're Bay Area guy, through and through. That's right. Berkeley undergrad, trained as a, an attorney at Hastings. That's right. Um, and your, your development, you focus on the Bay Area. Uh, we focus on the greater Bay Area. <clears throat> Most of our developments are within a two hour drive of San Francisco. And you also have a Sacramento office, is that correct? We do, we have offices in Palo Alto, mostly because I, that's where I live, uh, and then Sacramento as well. Okay. And most of our projects are neighborhood shopping centers, traditional um, barbell shopping centers with a supermarket and a drugstore. Okay, all right. Uh, you're a National Board of Trustees for ULI. I was. You were. You're, I'm you retired. You are or you were a governor of ULI? I am a governor. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm with ULI royalty here. Uh, <laughs> National Board of Directors for Outward Bound USA. Yes. Board of Directors for Rebuilding Together Peninsula. And yes. you're, you're a lecturer and a writer. That's right. So a monthly column for the, the Registry Magazine. <clears throat> How long have you been doing the, the writing? Uh, actually, I fell into that by kind of a, a series of coincidences about five or six years ago. And so I've been writing this monthly column. It's a real estate magazine, and most of the columns are about real estate, one way or another. It's a national magazine? I'd like it to be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's more regional, but it, okay. uh, it has, uh, since it's online, it, so it, it can be global. Building your Bay Area bona fides even more. Yeah. Um, so let's start with the present, and what are, what are you and McNellis Partners, what are you working on right now? We're working on uh, three mixed-use projects. Uh, as partners with Summer Hill Development. Okay. And these are large projects uh, in which we have a, a, a smaller role. Um, the, uh, the residential projects where the retail is a necessary component, uh, and so we're the retail partner. Okay. We're also working on some old fashioned, you know, ground up retail. Uh, we work a lot with uh, Safeway right now and a few of the other local markets. So you, you started out by saying that you're retail focused. So is the, the mixed use, is that relatively new? Uh, yes. It, I think we started, we did our first mixed use project. Uh, well, we started on it about 10 years ago and it opened okay. about uh, three, four years ago. But that's, that's definitely the future. Okay. Well, we'll get to the future a little bit later. You're All jumping right. ahead on me here. Um, going back to 82, you founded your, your firm? I did. When, what was that decision process, making the, the decision to jump out on your own? How did you do it? What was, what was going through your mind? In 82, I was a young real estate lawyer working with uh, a high-end uh, law firm in San Francisco. And I was a transaction lawyer, so I was working with developers. And I was making about, oh, $15,000 a year. And as near as I could tell, the developers who were uh, like five or six years older than I was were making a million dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, it, it looks like a developer is a, bit, a lot more fun than yeah. being a lawyer. And these guys are smart, but maybe I could do it as well. Uh, and so what happened in 82, I teamed up with an older client, hmm. a guy who had a lot of experience, good experience, um, and we became partners. And so we built our first you could call it adult deal, first $10 million shopping center in uh, 1983, I think. Okay. So how'd you get your name on the, the front door if he was a senior guy? <sighs> well, for the first, from 83 until 90, we were together and the, the partnership was called Rody McNellis. Okay. But in 1990, I had this epiphany where I decided uh, rather than have big financial partners, uh, and this has become almost a tagline when I talk, but, and you may have heard this already, but I decided uh, in 90 we had a crash similar to the one in 2009, almost as bad, but I decided I'd rather own 100% of a million dollar deal, of a little deal, than to own 10% of a $10 million deal and have financial partners that uh, I was subject to, you know, their whims. 
So uh, we parted company. Okay. So going back to that, so the first project. So when you did that first project with your partner, and then when you did your first project without him. Yes. What what were the projects? How I guess with with the first partner, you had his help in financing it, but ten years later, when you were <clears throat> fully independent. A good qu yeah, good question. That? So uh, the the first few deals were actually much larger. Uh, the deals in the 80s were larger because we had institutional financial okay. partners, so they were 10 to 20 million dollars uh, in the 80s, and then by 89 or 90, the wheels came off the economy, uh, and the financial partners were no longer there. And so, from that point forward, we were doing much smaller deals, two or three million dollar okay. deals, but using our own equity. Okay. Uh, without so, partners. So your own equity, meaning your from your 15 thousand dollars a year as a lawyer. <laughs> Well, the income had gone up a little okay. bit since then. <laughs> uh, we had had some luck with some of the properties, so yeah, it was a little more than 15000 a year. Okay. And when, when you did part ways, and it was just you, and I assume at that point, that's when it was McNellis Partners. Well, it wasn't just me. I took two of the partners, that, that ah. uh, the, the junior partners, with me. So the okay. three of us started McNellis Partners in, uh, let's say, 92. Okay, and, and at that point, you have 10 years under your belt, you have a track record as a partner. Right. And you're, you're feeling pretty comfortable yes. at that point. Well, reasonably. Okay. <laughs> so when, when it now becomes your, your burden, I guess shared burden with your, your two other partners, can you speak a little bit about what you had to go through mentally and personally to, to wrap your head around, if this thing doesn't work, it's on me? Um. That's interesting, Howard. It, it, when I started out, it wasn't really, it was more about having fun uh, than it mm -hmm. was about making money. So w when I started out, when I left the practice of law and shifted over into development, my, uh, my benchmark for success was I would just kind of keep track of my friends who were still partners at law firms. So it, it, let's just say that uh, a partner's income uh, at that time was 100000 a year. So I thought as long as I was making 100000 a year as a developer, because I was having a lot more right. fun. Right. Uh, I was okay. And so it, I wasn't worried about being the biggest developer okay. uh, in, in the country. Uh, and because I didn't have that pressure on me, and we had that, we pretty much always had at least that level of success. Okay. So I never really worried about it. And, and when you were an attorney on the transactional side, were you, were you focused on retail transactions at that point? How did, how did you come to focus on retail? Uh, that was a pure chance. Okay. As a transaction lawyer, I was doing everything, hotels, okay. industrial. It didn't really matter from a lawyer standpoint, but uh, the older partner I had, he was a retail developer. And so just by the fact that we teamed up, I became a retail developer. Okay. How over the years, and, and this is something that's of, of great interest to me personally, how have you stayed focused on that product type? Uh, Bay Area, there's obviously there, there's been a lot of, of booms and busts with every product type, but why stay focused on retail? And if you were doing it over again, would you change that focus? To answer your last question first, I wouldn't. I, I think, I don't think it matters what you specialize in. Uh, they're all, well, we have four or five main product types, hotel, office, industrial, retail, residential. They're all good. They all have their ebbs and flows. They all kind of come in and out of uh, industri excuse me, institutional favor. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for a young guy, it's really important that you, you pick one and specialize. The way that I can compete with much bigger companies, with say Regency Centers, which is the biggest uh, retail developer in our space, is by staying highly focused and highly localized. Okay, so the localized part. have. Has two hour there, drive. Has there been an urge to look further no. afield or it keeps you busy? No, one, I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> 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 Let's be honest here. Uh, and so I like to travel, but for fun. Yeah, okay. Travel for ULI is fun, travel with my family is fun. Getting on a plane to uh, Denver or to Philadelphia to look at a deal, I wouldn't be interested in that. Nothing against Philadelphia. Of no, no, no of it, but <laughs> the point is that uh, there are guys just as smart if not smarter than I am in Denver and Philadelphia and New York, and why is someone trying to pitch me a deal 2,000 miles mm -hmm. away? Why okay. haven't all the local guys done it? 
And, and if you try hard enough, there are enough deals, particularly in a, in a place like the Bay Area that's growing a lot, there are enough deals there for us. Okay. But I think uh, if I were trying to give a message to, to uh, younger developers, I think specializing and localizing uh, are, are two really good tools. Did you grow up in the Bay Area? Uh, no, I, I grew up, oh, this is being filmed, so I won't tell I won't. <laughs> <laughs> it can won't, be edited. I, I won't talk about the town I grew up in, but I moved to Berkeley okay. uh, as a freshman in 1969, so I've been there for 50 okay. years. So essentially, uh, okay. for California, that co that's like fifth generation of date. Of course. <laughs> so, so, but that localism came from, let's maybe college isn't necessarily everyone's adult years, but from the adult years. Yes. Okay. Yes, sure. Okay. And where, where in the Bay Area do you live in Palo Alto? Now? I live in a little town called Atherton, which is a couple okay. miles. Uh, it's adjacent to Palo Alto. So easy commute. Very easy commute. Um, if we can talk a little bit on the the personal side, the family side, when. You did go out again on your own. You don't have a, a paycheck coming from a, a large law firm. What did it take to make that work again on a, on a personal level? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, what I did, uh, I was very fortunate. The, the partners in my law firm liked me and they thought that I was pretty good at, at the, the business. And so I talked them into being uh, some of my original investors, oh, wow. uh, which helped in two ways. Uh, it helped raise money for that, that first adult deal I mentioned. The other thing is that they allowed me to go of counsel. So the, the problem with being a developer is the first five years you starve. So for uh, from the, like 1982 until 1986, I was practicing law on a part-time basis. So my law income was going down. Yes. Uh, and meanwhile, my developer income was going up but it would be almost impossible. And, and that, that's the tricky part about going out to become a developer is how do I get that money? You know, do I borrow whatever you need to live on, $100,000? How do I keep the income coming in? Yeah, and, and, and <clears throat> again, that's, that's something that I understand personally. It's in those first few years, you're trying to devote as much time as possible to the new entity, but you also have to find time to bring in some, some current income. So that's right. How, for a while, I actually worked pretty hard. <laughs> it didn't last, but for a while, yeah, I basically had two full-time jobs. And did, did you have to, when you were of counsel, did you have to do any business development work to keep that coming, or they fed you work and you were able to focus your time on the new deals? Actually, I was... A while ago, but... Yeah, no, I was pretty good at, at developing business, so okay. it, it kind of came in. So that, that wasn't a problem. Okay. Excellent. So... 34-year company history. All right. It's been booms and busts. Silicon Valley, there have been some very well-publicized booms and busts. How do you take advantage of, of the boom times? How do you survive through the down times? Okay, back to uh, product type and specificity. Retail's a little different. When you talk about booms and busts, particularly in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, people are really talking about office and residential. Retail uh, if you'll pardon the pun, is a little better grounded. Uh, and that's because Safeway is only going to sell so many groceries. And the number of groceries they're going to sell is dependent on the number of people within a, um, a mile or two mile radius and those, their incomes. And so Safeway, the rent that it can pay us is limited by that. Okay. So if it booms or busts, uh, so it's kind of annoying in a boom time because it's not <laughs> booming for us. Okay. On the other hand, we look pretty smart in a down market because people are still shopping, Safeway still paying rent. Okay. So retail is a lot flatter uh, than the other, uh, than particularly multifamily and office. And and I suppose and you're you're very reliant on, not entirely, but on a single tenant on Safeway. So, yeah, no, that you would go broke being reliant okay. on a single tenant. No, we have a number of great relationships. Okay. Uh, one of the charms of retail is that the same people stay in it. So the people that I knew 35 years ago who were working for Safeway or for Walmart or for Ross or for Walgreens, Starbucks came a bit later. They're all still in the business. They're all still local. They, they may have shifted companies, okay. but their local geographic knowledge is what they have that's of value. So they don't tend to leave the area. 
you know, they may have gone from Ross to Safeway to Walmart, okay. but they're still there in the area. And ours is very much a long-term relationship business, which I like. So if, if the booms and busts are, are somewhat more level relative to other products, right. retail trends are constantly changing. So they how, are. how do you adjust to that? How do you stay on top of what's happening out there? Maybe this is a, a cheap plug for ULI, but um, <laughs> how do you stay flexible and, and aware of those changes? Well, actually, I kind of accidentally discovered that we were a lot smarter than I thought uh, when the internet came along because suddenly I found out that what we had just sort of stumbled into, which was neighborhood shopping centers in mm -hmm. good cities, uh, first I found out that that's called necessity retail. And I said, I like that sound, okay. necessity <laughs> retail. So it's, it's not luxury, it's, it's not something that you can stop shopping at. Uh, but the internet is not gonna have a huge effect, uh, I promise, on supermarkets or on nail salons or on pizza parlors. Okay. Uh, and so the kind of tenants <clears throat> that we work with uh, you know, it, it's a very good niche to, to be in. Uh, and so then, uh, you know, I found out, oh, so our strategy is great. Uh, we sell off where uh, projects where there are no barriers to entry, but where there are high barriers along uh, US 101, Silicon Valley, uh, Marin County, and so on, we tend to keep those projects. We're, again, looking backwards a little bit while at the same time trying to think uh, in the future. Silicon Valley right now, Bay Area, from what outsiders hear, is extremely expensive. So would you be able to take the same approach today as you did earlier on? If, if a new developer is trying to break into the Bay Area market and trying to do retail, it feels like even the, the smaller retail spaces are pretty pricey. How, how might your strategy change if you were starting today, or maybe it wouldn't? Um, that's a good point. It, it's hard to say f from my perspective, but my guess is that let's say the rents are, are double or triple uh, in certain areas, but I think the yields are pretty much the same. Okay. So it may require more capital to get started, but I don't think if you, you just kind of gross everything up, your, your costs are higher, your rents higher, but I, I think it could still be done. Uh, same math, bigger numbers. Same math, bigger numbers, yeah. Have, have you seen over your career a, a bigger influx of institutional money or institutional players or national players? When, when you were starting out, was it, was it a, a local players market and has that changed? Yes, uh, the arc of development uh, and real estate ownership over the last 35 years has been uh, institutional. The, um, the big crash of what was that, 90, 91, 92, that wiped out a lot of the small guys. A lot of people left the business and never came back. There was an enormous consolidation. Uh, so the, crowd, the subsequent even bigger crash in 2009, uh, the real estate was held in, in far fewer hands you know, with deeper pockets. And so I don't think, as bad as it was, I don't think it was anything like uh, the effect that it had on individuals earlier. Okay, okay. Um, Shifting now again back to personal side, time management, uh, active with ULI, Outward Bound, rebuilding together Peninsula, the writing which we talked about. You, how do you find that time and, and why is it important to find that time or make that time? Well, I like to stay really active. You know, my wife teases me and she says, you know, your boss is really a jerk <laughs> and making you work all the time, you know, and why are you going in to write speeches or columns on Saturdays? But I like it. Uh, I think what's happened, Howard, is over the years, it's become less uh, intentional for profit work. And then I'm probably just as busy as I, as I ever was, but I'm doing other stuff that's more fun. So working on nonprofits, uh, working you know, with the ULI on teaching uh, people. Now, I'm not so sure that this is uh, the world's greatest charity, teaching people how to become better developers. <laughs> I think the Sierra Club might have a target on my back. But uh, doing that and then you know, writing is fun. Uh, I was a journalism major in college. I've always liked yeah. to write. And so for me, that's, that's just, a, I don't play golf, so what else am I gonna do on Saturday morning? <laughs> so it, it feels like it's an always on 
profession. Yeah. I, I guess yeah. For, for your approach and when yeah. you're the boss, especially. It, how, how many folks work for you uh, or the, with you? The whole company's about 10 or 11. Okay. And we're about the same size we were 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, I think another good piece of advice for young developers is don't crow your overhead. Uh, if you need a service, hire a consultant. Okay. And so how and when did you make the decision to bring on those, those additional employees? How, you, you have your partners. Yeah, my two principal partners. So when you made that first hire and the second and the third and the fourth, what was the decision-making process behind it and how do you manage, <clears throat> how much of your time are you spending now managing people versus managing projects? Yeah, I don't spend any time managing okay. people. I have a great deal. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my one partner, Mike Powers, is, is the, in essence, the president of the company, okay. uh, the CFO. He runs the company. And my other partner, Beth Walter, she runs uh, the employees, the property management, okay. and the construction management. And I'm free to give interviews <laughs> and find deals. Is it the property management, construction management, has that always been part of the, the business plan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we decided early on that, that we wanted... Um, as a way to manage overhead, to do all of our own property management. Okay. And we never thought of property management as a, a profitable endeavor, but as a way to pay our overhead. Hmm. And so, to your earlier question, we grew, we added employees when you know, we build a deal, build another deal, and suddenly you know, we have the more management needs. And so we'd add on a, an assistant property manager, okay. or we'd add on a, a superintendent of maintenance. Okay. That's how that happened. With your your partners, so they were they were junior partners in the previous entity. No, they're full partners. They they were. Yeah. Right. How? Why them? How are you picking your partners? What's important in a partner? It sounds like how you just described it. The three of you each have your own role within the company, but when when and how did you identify the the right partners? Uh, that's, that's more chance. You know, if you look back on life, it's a straight line, but at, at any given point, uh, when you're looking, trying to make a decision, things can go in mm -hmm. multiple directions. Uh, what happens is you, when you see somebody who's really good uh, and you have the opportunity to hire them uh, or say take them on as a partner, you do it. And, and that's, uh, that's what happened with, with mine too. And it's worked out great. Excellent. Um, all right, so, as I'm sure you know, ULI is always interested in lessons learned. Okay. So, 34 years and counting, um, product focus, geographically focused, two partners, company with uh, close to a dozen people, uh, booms and busts, different tenants, um, decisions to leave a salary job. What are, what are the key lessons learned? What are the things that you would impart to folks who, who want to emulate what you've done that are, are the key lessons that have come out of this along the way. So just encapsulate 34 years in, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Here lies John McNellis. Uh, I think what's, what worked best for us, and it doesn't, the, one of the fun parts about business is there are a million ways to do it. Uh, and, and even in real estate, there, there are, are fellows who do brilliantly having big institutional partners. I think the key lesson for us was deciding that we'd rather be small and independent. Okay. Uh, I think that has worked out. That's enabled us to do exactly what we want, to sell properties when we want to, uh, and more importantly, to keep properties when we want to. Mm -hmm. If you have a large financial partner, you can have a project that's just great and suddenly the market just goes a little bit awry and you're 80% leased and all the profit, of course, is in the last 20%. And somebody in New York says, well, we got to sell it now. Yes. Uh, that's, that happened to me. Uh, that happens to everybody. So coming to the realization that we'd rather not have that deal, we'd rather just have a deal that we can control, I think that's probably one of the key lessons. Um, I've, I've, I've heard others speak about, as a developer, you think you're, you're your own boss, but now really your boss is the lender. Your boss is the lender. Uh, but, you know, that's another a good point. I think the bank is your best partner. Okay. You know, it, if you're, you're an honorable guy and you're going to pay the money back, uh, it, I mean, the benefit to having um, a bunch of limited partners, 
the theoretical or technical benefit is if things go wrong, you don't have to pay them back. But if it's friends and family, and if you put your mother and your uncle and right. your secretary and your college buddies in the deal, if things go wrong, you're still going to pay them back. You know, you're, you're, or at least you're going to do your best to pay them right. back. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to pay them back anyway, borrow the money from the bank instead, because the bank's going to insist you pay them back, yeah. <laughs> and, and you get to keep 100% of the profit rather than you know having your fraternity brothers get 50%. Are are your lending relationship have they stayed? fairly steady, or do you have different lenders that you go to over time? Yeah, that's another good lesson. You need more than one bank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you absolutely, every right. developer, in fact, I had a client when I was a very young lawyer tell me that you need three banks. He said, I will go to one bank exclusively when my banker promises never to get sick, never to retire, <laughs> never to run out of money, and so on, uh, but having, uh, at least two, three strong banking relationships okay. is very important. Well, and as we learned not too long ago, those banks can disappear. Right. So, so having a, a strong <laughs> relationship with an ex, our principal bank's Wells Fargo, a okay. great bank, and they, they've really taken great care of us. And it, so during the, the last downturn, speaking of banks, what you had said that, that the booms and busts are relatively flat, but we had a big bust not too long ago. Were, were you caught up in that? Or did that hold true, that relatively steady? Uh, actually, I have a, a good friend who should also interview, Bob Hughes, who is uh, a longtime ULI member. And, and we bumped into each other, let's say, in, here at ULI. And his experience was the same as ours. Because uh, we develop with uh, a lot of equity and kind of a limited amount of debt, and we didn't have to sell anything. Uh, Bob said, I ran into him in the hall, and this was uh, kind of at the depth of, of the depression. He said, John, my net worth's gone down by half, but my cash flow's the same. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I get okay. that. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, long-term real estate deals are like bonds. If you, uh, the value may drop, but if you don't have to sell them, you're still getting whatever right. your yield was. Right. And, and so it, it was painful, particularly painful to see other friends in trouble, but uh, no, we were fine throughout what, that. What's your average hold time on your projects? Um, well, some we want to sell, Howard, the moment we sign the lease. Okay. <laughs> uh, and some we want to sell never. Uh, I have four children, none of whom are likely to go into business. Uh, the oldest daughter, my daughter Jamie, I showed her one shopping center when she was 16. We were on our way somewhere and I said, Jamie, one day some guy who, who looks and sounds like Howard <laughs> is going to try to buy this shopping center from you, you know, and I'll be long gone. You'll be 80 years old. Don't sell it. I would never try to get between a 16-year-old girl and a shopping mall, so <laughs> I won't be that guy. Yeah, no, there, again, if, if it's a brilliant location that we're, it, that's absolutely kind of geographically and politically impenetrable, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a neighborhood grocery market. Yeah, we love those, and so we, we don't sell them. Okay. Do you, and in general, it sounds like you think the, the long-term hold is the right strategy, or it depends? It depends. I, it's actually here. I'll, I'll give you, uh, the, I think in the 35 years, we've done something like 75 projects, and we've sold maybe 50 of them. If you don't sell, then you can't become independent. Because you always start out with somebody okay. else's money, right? Your family and friends, and then you're, you're, you're lucky you have institutional money. But if you have the we're never going to sell mode, you always have those partners. Right. So what we had to do, and we had to, this we figured out, we had to start doing deals, sell them, so we then pay the taxes or trades so we'd have capital to do our own deals. And again, we try to keep the, the uh, the best ones, okay. uh, and then sell off ones that are, are a little bit out of our core or uh, you know, that we just don't love for whatever so, reason. So over time, is it fair to say then when at, in the early stages you were selling more sooner, and then as you were able to build more and more of the track record and, and the equity, you started shifting more towards holding? No. Or not that straightforward? It's not that straightforward. It, it, it's more, what's the opportunity Okay, here you present us a good opportunity. We say we like this, you know, we like the yield, but we don't love it. You know, so uh, pretty much 
we know before we buy something whether we're going to keep it or not. Okay. Um, just because of the location, because of the tenants, um, you know, does it fit our uh, supply lines? You know, for our property management, is it too far away? So no. Okay. Yeah, we we tend to know. Looking forward, so yeah. we have a downturn somewhere in our future. We uh, have interest rate hikes somewhere in our future. Um, retails continuing to evolve. What are your thoughts looking forward? For, for, let me rephrase that a little bit. What are your thoughts looking forward for folks who are getting ready to go out on their own or have just gone out on their own? How to take advantage of what might come and how to insulate them against the, the negatives that might come? Um, I'm not sure of that. I, I think we are in for a, at least a, a pretty significant correction uh, fairly soon. I don't think that's going to affect uh, Main Street. You know, the, okay. I, I think it's more you know, Wall in New York City, Silicon Valley. I, uh, I think that there is a correction coming. Uh, I, I think you insulate yourself by having a, uh, relatively little debt. I have been wrong on interest. I've been thinking that interest rates are going up for the last 10 or 12 years. So I'm wrong on that. As far as I know, <laughs> they're, they're going to stay down forever. I mean, I have. Uh, is, my crystal ball is totally cloudy on that, so I don't know what's going to happen. But And I also think, unfortunately, no matter how smart you are, if you get into the development market at the wrong time, mm. like if you got in very heavily in 2005, 6, and 7 at the peak, it, then it wouldn't matter if, if you were um, Albert Einstein's son, it, you'd still go broke. I mean, everything collapsed after right. that. So a, a lot of it, fortunately or unfortunately, is just a matter of timing of when you get in. I think we're at a peak right now, so I'm not certainly in office, certainly in, in residential. I, I would not suggest that in Northern California anybody jump into those two yeah. product types. But, touching on something that you said previously, if um, do you feel reasonably well insulated? If, if Bay Area housing prices go down, let's say they go down substantially, mm -hmm. yes, people still have to eat. People still have to eat. So they're still going to come to Safeway. Um, but if those jobs aren't there, are the people going to stay? Are you going to have as many shoppers? Will your tenants be able to pay the same rents? Or is necessity retail that well insulated that it can really absorb a lot of that shock? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I'll give you an example. We put a center on, we brought a center online, an excellent center in the uh, East Bay in 2004. Um, here's a mistake I made, which I, I would recommend the, the viewers not to make. <laughs> I, I did all the shop leases at five years. So, so the class of 2004 matriculated in 2009, <laughs> uh, and I spent 2009 um, as an assistant to my junior assistant leasing agent, where I was personally running around trying and had other problems, but all of those tenants, uh, let's say their rents were here, mm -hmm. well, by 2009, they had dropped uh, 30%, and I was doing everything I could just to keep the tenants in, in place. So, uh, you now we were able to keep the center virtually fully leased, but the rents ha had to drop. Now, you can only do that uh, if you have sufficient equity in a deal, if you have a very high loan and a lender right. won't allow you to do that, you've got a problem. Okay. Um, this shifting quite a bit here. Um, so you said you keep it small. When you need help, you hire that help as, as right. third party. Um, architects, engineers, attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have a, a stable of those folks that yes. you pull from, or are you using the same architects, same engineers, same Well, it's kind, of, it's kind of like Noah's Ark. You need two of every. <laughs> like the banks. Like, yes, like okay. the banks, yeah. Uh, we've used two contractors principally for the last, since 19, the last 26 years. Okay. One of, but, and you have to let them know about each other. Uh, but then we don't put it out to bid. We just say, okay, Howard, this is your turn. You know, give us your best number. Okay. We use the same escrow company. We use the same architects. What, if you use the same people over and over again, 
I mean, I, I can't tell you the last time I looked at one of those service provider contracts. It's okay, we're going with Howard's construction yeah. company. What's the amount? Five million, great, sign it. So if you use the same people and you treat them well, uh, a small company like mine can play like a big company. Because okay. even, even though the architect's outhouse or, or the engineer is, is outside, it's like they're part of the, the, we just call them, get started on it. It's like they're in the office. Okay, so they're, they're more like partners than they are yeah, they consultants. Are. Yeah, and we've okay. worked with everybody forever. And, and so as a result, you feel comfortable that you're getting best pricing, best service, et cetera? Yeah. Comfortable yeah. enough. Yeah, I'm comfortable enough, okay. right. I'm comfortable enough. Okay. Um, so last question, ULI. How, how somebody that, again, is coming up and, and trying to strike out on their own or has just started to, how can they best make use of ULI? You know, ULI is a phenomenal resource for anybody who wants to be in real estate. Uh, I don't think, of course, it's been a long time. Uh, uh, I don't think it's changed that much. When I first showed up and you could hear uh, the gods of real estate talking about and people you've heard of, or you, you read about in the newspapers, talking about the mistakes that they had made or lessons that they had learned. Uh, and you, could, you walk in and it's, it's not that much to join. Uh, you know, and now we have you know, the mentor-mentee programs. I've been doing that for the last five or six years where, where I have a group of five or six young men and women and, and we meet a few times a year. You know, I think you can learn so much, for essentially for free. I mean, this is like graduate school for uh, uh, the maybe real not, estate world. Maybe not free. Well, <laughs> virtually free. <laughs> Let's just say there's a great value there. Yes. Yeah, maybe not free. I, okay. yeah. uh, but anyway, I, I think, and I have made great, great friends through the ULI. And the people, you know, when I started, so I was probably in my late 20s, those people, those those young junior bankers, are now running the banks. Uh, <laughs> you know? yeah. So ULI is very much a long game, you know. But you get involved, you meet the best people in real estate, and they do well, and, and you you kind of grow up together and you work together. It's a long term hold with yeah, ULI, also. It's a long term hold with ULI. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So um, localism, product specification, um, choosing your partners wisely, and. Sounds like treating your, your consultants and your vendors like partners. Yes, those are all good. Seems like some of the keys to success here. Yeah. Uh, well, John McNellis, McNellis Partners, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, really Robert. appreciate it. My pleasure. I look forward to seeing you out in the Bay Area. Okay. Thanks.